Well, welcome to the Business Brains and the Bottom Line podcast. My name is Paul Delegri, your host, and my guest today is Pandit Dasa. Welcome to the show, Pandit. Thank you so much, Paul. Very happy to be here. Yeah, so we're going to cover a few different subjects today, but you've got such a fascinating story. We'll, we'll kind of start with that. You're an author, you're a coach, but you were also a monk for many years, which is just a fascinating life. And you were a monk in New York City, which I don't even know how that's even possible with all the you know, a th- you know, all the influences of New York City to try to be a monk and live that type of life. But uh, and we're also going to talk about, you know, what you do as a coach about leadership and work culture and try to help people along those lines. But let's start with your journey. You know, you're born in India. You came here as a child. And tell us about how that worked out. Yeah. So you know, my parents migrated to the U.S. from India in 1980. They came over with a little to no money, the classic sort of immigrant story. Worked seven days a week, set up a small booth selling gift items on Venice Beach, California. Seven days a week, within about eight years, with a lot of hard work and luck, I think both go hand in hand when success for success to happen. They established a multi-million dollar jewelry business within eight years. We began living the American dream much faster than we expected to. We didn't expect that kind of success. And, you know, got a big house, six bedroom house on the hill pool, jacuzzi, like full-blown 90210 sort of lifestyle. And everything was great for a while. In 1992, roughly, their jewelry factory caught on fire, burnt down. We lost the business, lost everything we had, Wow! went completely broke. And in 1992, 1993, my dad decided to explore new business opportunities in post-communist Bulgaria. So we okay. pack up our life and move to Bulgaria. Wow. How, how old are you at this point? 21. I was 21 at that time. And just to give you an idea, a little context, no one spoke English because it had just come out of communism like a year before we got there. So the country is in sort of upheaval. They don't even have an identity. The people didn't even really have an identity. Like, who are we now? Right? Coming uh, uh, Basically, a new system of governance was being installed, and that's not easy for anyone. And during this time of confusion and sort of in my life and upheaval financially, emotionally, socially, recreationally, everything, that's when I began a mindfulness journey just to be able to stay calm and sane in the middle of all that was going on. No, I started practicing mindfulness and meditation. We spent a couple of years there, moved back to the U.S. to the East Coast. Then in 1999, I decided to go to India to live in a monastery with the idea of just being there for a month to live with monks, learn how to meditate, learn about life, ask the big questions in life and how I wanted to live the rest of my life. So, you know, I was there for, uh, the idea was to be there for a month living with 40 monks in Mumbai, India. Everybody slept on a hardwood floor. No one had a mattress, a bed or their own room. It was communal living. We're meditating several hours a day, bright and early at 5 a.m. Rest of the day was spent serving one another, serving the community. It was a life of simplicity, humility, and service. And to my own surprise, I fell in love with that lifestyle. Really? Yeah. So how how long were you in India? How long did you do it there for? Well, the idea was a month. I ended up spending six months there in a few different monasteries. Okay. Then I came back and moved into a monastery in New York. And spent a total of 15 years, mostly in New York, as a monk, which was not part of my life plan. It wasn't part of my five-year, 10-year, or even one-day life plan. But you must have loved it, though. I mean, to do something for 15 years, 20, whatever, whatever, how many years, you had to have a passion for. You must have enjoyed it. Yeah. I mean, it was incredibly satisfying, especially because I'd never grown up thinking that I should live a life of serving others, that I should live a life of really, really understanding who I am and what my purpose in life is. And I think so many people in life struggle with understanding their purpose. And being in the monastery, when you have enough time for yourself to introspect on who you want to be and how you want to live and what contribution you want to make in the world, because usually as, as we're growing up, it's like money, 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 chase, chase, chase. Yeah. And in no, that chase, you know, what you leave behind is yourself. Yes. 
you leave yourself behind and you get way out there, not even knowing who you really are. How, how, if you don't know who you are, you cannot understand your purpose. So I feel like it gave me so much time to understand myself. But at the same time, I began teaching. So I started lecturing on college campuses around the New York City area, like Columbia, New York University, then around the country to college students, high school students about purpose, mindfulness, meditation, yeah. work life balance. So the combination of introspection, practicing my own meditation and teaching others was incredibly satisfying. And I think that the combination of those threes was facilitated me being in that lifestyle for 15 full years. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. It's obviously something you're passionate about. And uh, I, don't, I think yeah. you're, now you're, you're <laughs> a public tough. speaker, you give coaching. I'm sure that, that, that you look at that as almost fun because you get so much back from it, I would think. Oh, I mean, it is, I am so grateful uh, for what I have and the life I'm able to live, the work that I'm able to do. Basically, even though I haven't been a monk now for 10 years, I'm living a similar lifestyle because yeah. I was giving talks at that time. I'm giving talks now. I was meditating and living a certain lifestyle. Then I'm continuing to live a similar lifestyle now. So yeah, for the last 10 years, I've been a professional public speaker, speaking in corporations and conferences globally on Mindful leadership, work-life balance, workplace culture, yeah. mental health, and mindfulness. So it's incredibly satisfying. I mean, just yesterday I gave a talk to about 600 people virtually for a Fortune 500 company. I got such incredible feedback. Like this session came at the right time. I needed all these tools because I'm so stressed at work. And I read that. I'm like, wow, it's just nice that I'm able to make a small impact. Yeah, absolutely. A small population. I think things are changing. I think when I was growing up, you get a job and you're told you got to do your time. You got to suck it up. If you got a terrible boss, you just got to deal with it. And you dealt with all this stress. I think I look back to times in my life that I was so stressed out because of work uh, that I couldn't really enjoy my life. And I think that's changing. I, people are much more open about their feelings, uh, how they're feeling, the effect on that of their work environment, family environment. That's where a guy like you come in that can educate these people. Yeah, I think especially the pandemic uh, created this whole concept called the great resignation where people were more than ever ready to walk away from a toxic workplace environment yes. where their bosses and managers treated them purely as a machine, a number, and really ignored, not all of them, obviously, but where the workplace culture was just toxic and no matter what the cost is to your mental and physical health, we just need you, need you to get this work done. And your personal problem is your personal problem. Right. And we're, we're not responsible for that. Yeah, and I and think you, people are less willing to tolerate that kind of an attitude. And that is spreading far and wide where people are less and less willing to tolerate uh, indifferent, callous attitude that you know leaders and managers would have towards the workforce because it just isn't good for the individual and when it, if it's not good for the individual it's not good for the team and then ultimately it's not good for the organization so yeah you're yeah. right things are changing people are becoming more aware and less tolerant of that toxic work yeah. culture i will say this about the younger generation today i know a lot of people you know every every generation always dogs and the ones after them right the, you know but i would say this the young kids today they don't put up with anything if they're not yeah. happy, if they get getting mistreated, they're going to do something about it. They're going to quit, walk out the door. I mean, I, kudos to them. We were raised differently, though. And I, I'm not saying differently in a better way. I think we just, I, I sucked it up on jobs at, with, with toxic environments for years, just figuring, hey, just got to, I got to be a tough guy, right? I got to suck it up and do it. And looking back, I kind of scratched my head, wonder why, right? Well, you know, I think there's a good and bad side to everything. Well, yeah, so... Being able to, like the newer generation is saying, they're willing to walk away from things, not tolerate it. That's good. And it's also not so good because then, then you might, you might end up feeling like you could just walk away from anything and everything. And maybe you walk away from things too quick. Maybe, sure. maybe we're too quick to walk away and give up on things without really giving it our full effort. And whereas, like you said, your generation, maybe my generation, my parents definitely really were just like, I just see my parents that they have a certain toughness. That sure. I lack. Right. Like, like they're just built. It's a different machine. And yeah. they can tolerate so much more. 
So I don't know. It's hard to, you'd have to do a really big and broad comparison as to what is better, that toughness, that resilience that's developed through sticking it through the struggles, but stick, not sticking it through such that your mental health breaks down, but being, but it does build toughness. Like when you go yeah, to the gym yeah. and you weights, then you get stronger. So, yeah. you know, I think it can go both ways. Sure. Right? That, that, good and bad a, to almost right. You make a good point. Like I'm not saying, you know, quit after a week, but you, but you're right. There's a certain there's a certain stick to itness that can be applied here. That hey, it's not perfect, but I'm gonna you know it's I can still make this work. And you know, and, and I look back at my career. I'm trying to relate this to my career. I've had a couple of instances where at the beginning I was like, man, I'm not sure this is gonna work out. And I end up having long careers at these companies. So it did work out, but I stuck with it and didn't quit at the first sign of trouble. Um, so you're right. I, I think it can go both ways. Yeah. And, you know, also this generation, for them to be willing to walk away, it puts managers and leaders on alert that we need to make sure to, we, we have to try harder to keep people. And yeah. I think that's a good thing, right? That That is, so again, there's a good and bad side to everything. Sure. The good side is companies are realizing that, hey, we could lose people. And so we need to change our culture. We need to change the way yeah. we train our leaders. And leaders shouldn't just become leaders simply because of their performance and charisma, but also they also need to have empathy yeah. and care for the, and really be able to care for the people that they are overseeing. Yeah. So that kind of leads me to my next question. You're talking about company cultures and, you know, what are the issues that you see? You're out there every day talking to companies, you know, about their culture and how to change their culture. What are the biggest issues you're seeing out there? Well, one thing is that, um, you know, mental health struggles are increasing more and more. And I think because of COVID, because as social beings, we were forced to not be social and be, we got isolated in our homes. And a lot of times people were isolated by themselves or with your family and everybody's struggling to work and your kids are studying at the same time. So whatever mental health struggles we had really came to the forefront during COVID. And, uh, and those started manifesting in the workplace because if you're struggling mentally, there's not much you can do properly at work and that means you can't focus you can't get work done you can't properly cooperate with your colleagues people see something is wrong so i think one of the main things that people were asking me companies were asking me to speak about is self-care and taking care of our mental emotional and physical well-being okay. and the demand was greater than I've ever experienced. It's just everybody wanted to talk about that. And they really wanted me to talk about workplace culture and helping lead and communicating to leaders that they need to lead by example, not just in terms of their productivity, but also in the way that they're maintaining their own mental health. Because if they're not maintaining their mental health, if they're dealing unhealthily with the people that they're working with, then that is the culture they're helping to establish, communicating to everyone else that it's okay to not take care of your mental health. The thing is, if we're not taking care of our mental health, we're going to not be able to communicate and collaborate in a positive way with our colleagues. And that's going to affect and impact the way we interact with our clients. That If you show sure. up, not yeah, at absolutely. full strength, full, full capacity, and have a conversation with a client who's going to trust you with their business and money, you can forget about it. So yeah. I think this is what I'm really seeing, and uh, companies are really eager to inform and educate and provide support to their leaders and the workforce at large on ways to improve and maintain their mental health. So obviously... Uh... We don't want to give all, all your secrets today because they got to hire you to get that. But what are some of the examples of things companies can do, employees can do to create a better work culture, a better work environment? And by the way, I'm happy to share as many secrets uh, as you want. <laughs> so I feel like, you know, if somebody still wants me to come out there, I'm happy to come out there. Otherwise, I'm happy to give it away. Not a, yeah, not a problem. Absolutely. You know, and one thing is, one of the key things is in terms of having that positive workplace culture. So when I give my talks, a question I ask to the audience is whether it's in person or virtual, like how often do you appreciate a colleague? 
And immediately it gets people thinking like, oh my gosh, I'm like, was it today? Was it yesterday? Has it been a month since I've said anything positive to a colleague for what they've done? And it's not to call anyone out. It's just to raise awareness for themselves because sure. I'm not asking them to raise their hand and say something. But if it's a virtual, then I'll have them put it in the chat if they want to put it in the chat. And somebody said, yeah, it's been too long. Someone said, I did it today. I do it weekly. I'm like, great, awesome. Right. And just seeing somebody say that encourages those who aren't doing so. Maybe I should say something. Right. So I think this is really important that we create a culture where we take time out to appreciate the contributions of our colleagues. And that contribution needs to have two important components. One, it should be timely, not like six months later. Hey, you know, six months ago, back in June, you did something that really inspired me. Well, that's not as meaningful <laughs> as opposed to, hey, you said something in a meeting that was so positive. You really put a positive spin on the whole thing. And it made me think differently. And I felt really inspired by your comment. Like, whoa, if somebody said all that to me, I'd have a great rest of the day. Right? Yeah, no, so, it makes you feel... You know, I often right. said, you know, we'd, we'd like to think we're tough guys and, and we, you know, the, but, you know, a nice pat in the back once in a while goes a long way, right? Goes a long ways. And so being timely in this appreciation and also being specific, right? Be specific, really point out. And in order for us to be specific, it requires thoughtfulness. That means I stopped and I really thought about like, what's, how is Paul contributing? And I'm like really meditating on you for a moment because you were colleagues, we're working together. And this could be great for our relationship for me to meditate on the work that you're doing, not to find fault, but to appreciate. And this way, when I do that, you'll be like, wow, Pundit's such a nice guy. He's like, he's like looking at the good work that I'm doing. And now what do you do? You start thinking about the good work that I'm doing. It's just natural human psychology. When I say something sure. good to you, you naturally want to think, good things about me. Whereas if I criticize you, the first thing you're going to do is criticize the heck out of me and everything I'm yeah. doing wrong. So it's just human psychology. So if we start, so one thing I really encourage and emphasize is let's, and, and appreciation doesn't just have to come from the leadership. It doesn't just have to come from top down. It's yeah. absolutely a must that they do it uh, for sure. But uh, my message is that I think it's everyone's duty and responsibility in an organization to appreciate their colleague because it is everyone's responsibility to create a positive and healthy culture. A healthy culture isn't dependent on one leader or two right. leaders. It's dependent on everyone. It's like, it's like if you have five horses pulling a chariot, everyone's responsible for getting, making forward progress on that chariot. You know, if one of the horses says, you know, I'm just going to lay down here. Well, that chariot isn't really going too far. Uh, so, it's everyone's responsibility. You don't need a job title to sure. appreciate and uplift your colleague. Everyone yeah, and like like you said, that's like top down, right? That's if the if the leaders are taking care of themselves, if, both physically and mentally, and the, everyone else sees that. I think it would be contagious at that point. Yeah, just like negativity is contagious. So is positive behavior and demonstration. So when, you know, sometimes during my talks, I have CEOs of large corporations attend and they'll acknowledge that they haven't been the best at self-care and maybe they're not setting the best example. And for the rest of the employees to hear that, it's powerful when a leader can be vulnerable and humble about it and try to improve. Like, wow, that sounds amazing. So, and I got to believe, uh, you know, if you, if you have an environment where people are quitting and leaving at all, all the time, the cost of replacing an employee is really high. So I would think there's a financial benefit to this too, along with obviously the emotional, personal benefits. I would think the companies would want to create this culture, maintain their employees so they can have long lasting careers and not have to keep replacing people. Because when you replace, I forget the numbers, I've heard numbers in the past, what it costs to replace some of it. It's not an inexpensive proposition. Yeah, I think I read something not too long ago where whatever their salary is, it takes almost six months of their salary to re replace someone, you know, because you have to hire people to find them, to interview them, you, could, you interview 10 candidates, you finally get one, then when they're finally in the company, now you have to spend months training them to get them to the place where the other one was at, right? And so it could take six months of that one person's income, but not just that. There's an emotional toll that takes place in that team, in that department. Right. When someone leaves, it's not a good feeling. 
because what are what is everyone doing? They're spending time in the coffee room or when they go for walks talking about what really happened. And there's a fear now that's created like what really happened? Could this happen to me? Should I start applying? Let me reach out to that person and see what went wrong. There's a now instead of focusing on the work with a peace of mind, people are wondering what went wrong and what they should do to protect themselves. Right. And from th- that happening to them. So, yeah. a- and then now we're spending time thinking about this and talking with each other. Maybe some gossip is going on. Sure. It really, and unfortunately, it's so obvious, but a lot of times leaders don't even see that that's what's causing this. Like if you have somebody let leaves or it's let go of, and there's not proper healthy communication about what happened, it just creates a fear and anxiety and it puts a bad taste in everyone else's mouth and it's distracting them from being productive. Yeah, that, that makes it's, complete sense. It's the fear, fear of the unknown, on, right? That's not inspiring for anyone. Yeah. So when you give your talks, do you give them, in this day and age, and I think COVID has helped in one thing, all these video conferences are becoming much more natural for people. Like, I think, you know, I know early on, I hated turning on my camera. I hated, but now it just, I can tell you I'm in sales and, you know, we deal with customers and we, we have no problem, you know, meeting virtually, turning on a camera. It's not, I don't think it's the same as shaking a hand and seeing someone, but it's the next best thing. Um, I think COVID really helped with that. That was the one, not, not much came, good came out of it. But if I had to say one good thing, that, that did come out of it. Yeah. I mean, you know, the other good thing that came out of it is us becoming more aware of our mental health (laughs) and that we need to take care of it. Like one in five U.S. adults are struggling with it and we're just ignoring it or letting it go, thinking it will resolve itself. But injuries don't resolve themselves. They need attention. So there are quite a few good things that came out of it. Us also analyzing our own lifestyle. How are we treating the planet Earth? I mean, we don't want to get into a philosophical discussion here, but that also came. Out, came out of it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so there are the, behind every negative thing. There's a ton of lessons that the more we ex- extract them and excavate the lessons, you write, you're like, wow, that was really a powerful lesson to learn. But uh, yeah, so I mean, virtually before COVID, ninety five percent of my speeches were in person. Right during COVID, when I thought my speaking business would shut down, it actually doubled. Because uh, everybody was struggling with their mental health and work-life balance. So companies were reaching out to me and I was doing multiple sessions for some companies. I was doing dozens of sessions for each year, like every month, twice a month, three times a month, just getting on calls. So during the 2020 and 2021, I was close to doing about 100 virtual sessions a year. Wow, that's a uh, lot. That it was a lot. It was a lot. And I mean, I'm, I'm glad that I could do that much because I was thinking I was going to be like going on a two, two year meditation retreat is like what I was thinking I was going to end up doing. And then in 2022, when things were kind of winding down, I gradually started doing in person. So now it's about 75% of my speeches. I fly out to some part of the country where the conference is. I do my thing. And 25%, a lot of companies are like, Hey, you know, if you want a conference, why? Fly everybody out to a location, spend tons of money on hotels and flights and food. Let's just log everyone in yeah. <laughs> from around the globe. So let's, yesterday yeah. my, the time was like people from around the globe for this one Fortune 500 company logged in from all parts of the planet. So for yeah. them, it's so cost effective to do that. Yeah. No, in that case, you know, there, there are advantages to it, but I don't know. I'm a little old fashioned in the sense that there's nothing like seeing someone live. Like I, I, I'm trying to relate this to my career and my customers. You know, yeah. you, it's one thing to jump on a Zoom call. Yeah, you can exchange pleasantry, but there's nothing like going out to lunch with someone, maybe going out to dinner, yeah. learning about their families, what's going on in their life, and just sharing those common common things that we have. And uh, I don't know, Zoom call, Zoom calls and, and Teams calls just don't capture that. No, definitely. And if I'm ever given a choice, I will 100% uh, take the option of getting up physically in front of an audience, getting on that stage and making eye contact, shaking hands right. before an actor. There's no, it's like, it's like watching a basketball football game on TV versus live on, in the stadium. Right. World of difference, right? Yeah. So I also prefer to be, I like to be around people. I yeah. want to be there live because the interaction I get, because 
like a lot of time I do the talk, if there's 300 people on a call, I can't see anyone's faces. Sure. I don't know if people are checking their phone, if they're taking a nap, what's going on, yeah. right? Where when they're in the audience, I can try to scan the audience and make eye contact. Even if there's 500 people, I'm trying to just look at different people, let yeah. them know that I'm looking at them, I'm noticing them, and then I value that they're there and they're present. So there's nothing that beats in-person yeah. engagement, at least for me. Yeah, and then I can almost guarantee you that after every speech that you give or a lecture that you give, you get, I'm sure you have ton, tons of people that come up to you and shake your hand and thank you for your time. And that was one that makes you feel good, right? Talk about giving that positive feedback, right? And uh, recognition. Yeah, totally. And also just that uh, beyond just the positive feedback and recognition, it's also just that human connection uh, is so powerful to connect personally yeah. and in person with another human. I know I, I, I close most of my speeches by teaching people like a short five minute mindfulness practice, like breathing exercises, focusing exercise, even if it's a thousand people in the audience and I have people coming up to me sometimes in tears and because wow. they never take the time to go inward. And I just do five minutes of, you know, it's all secular practices, just breathing and focusing, but I have them put away everything and just go inward and breathe and stuff comes up for them that they've been ignoring and sometimes people will say, you know, I, I broke down in tears. And some, sometimes people say, I had a headache before this and now it's gone. My back is lighter. My neck feels better. Nice. And it's incredible. Like Paul, the kind of stuff people tell me, it kind of blows. It's 10, 20 years later of still teaching. I'm still amazed when people tell me this, even though I've heard thousands of people tell me this, I still get amazed. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm glad your neck pain went away after five minutes of meditating with me, you know? So, so, you know, obviously you're brought in to give a speech, right? Give a, give a lecture, give a talk on this. What happens when you leave? Do you have follow-up programs? Do you have programs in place, like tangible things that these companies can do after you leave? So I do provide very practical tips on how they can do what I'm explaining, right? How to appreciate each other, how to practice mindfulness, throughout your day, even if it's for one or two minutes, you don't have to do it on the weekend or when you get home, you could do it before a meeting, after a meeting, whatever it is, right? Throughout your day, just like decompress a little bit, just like you let off steam in those Instapot things, right? You let, let the steam comes out, like yeah. let the steam off in your mind or the way I like to phrase it, close the apps in your mind so that it can work better. It's, it has more, it has more clarity. And then a lot of companies will also just bring me back virtually to continue to, as a, to serve as a reminder of the things yeah. that I talked about, to continue to encourage employees to take, to maintain their self care, to maintain their mental health, to continue communicating mindfully, to help get rid of that mental health stigma, to appreciate their colleagues. So they'll bring Beautiful. me back for a virtual session. So as, cause you know, we never, we usually forget messages after we hear them. Yeah. We need multiple reminders. That's just how yeah. we are. Yeah. That's kind of where I was leading to that is like, it's all rah, rah. And this is great stuff when you're in front of them. And then, you know, the camera goes off or you leave the room and they go back to work. How do we continue yeah. that momentum? Yeah. Yeah. What that's you it. You know? Yeah. No, go ahead. No, no. I was going to say, go ahead, finish your thought. No, that, that, that was it. That really it's, uh, and then I also sometimes encourage like, Hey, if you enjoy the med mindfulness practice and some of your colleagues enjoyed it too, connect with them and see if you can just share your experience with them, kind of have a conversation about it, right? Keep it in the forefront of your mind. So I got a question. This is, this is one I bet you run into. Well, how do you handle a situation where you get called in and some of the leaders think there's no problems? They're like, I don't even know why you're here. Like we're, this is, we have a great company. I'm a great leader. My employees love me and we know they don't. How do you handle someone like that delicately? So, you know, I'm usually speaking in public settings, right? So it's groups of people, hundreds of people usually. Um, all I can really do is communicate my message and really request people to go internal, ask themselves, are they leading by example? Are they appreciating their colleagues? Are they leading on a fear-based leadership model or inspiration-based leadership model? Yeah. And if some leaders don't want to hear it, if their mind is closed, there's nothing I can do to open them because the only person that has the key to opening their mind is themselves. Right. And if, if they've thrown away that key, then that mind is locked 
and it's going to be the way it is. And they chose to lock that and throw away the key at some point in their life. Why and how? Who knows? Not enough introspection, not enough humility to hear feedback. And that is what it is. I cannot physically crack that mind open, nor am I trying to. I'm not going to, you know, I, I can take the horse to water, but I can't force it to drink. Yeah. And that's all I can do. I can present it, take them to the water, and ultimately, like uh, Morpheus said to Neo in The Matrix, ultimately you have to choose one or the other. Yeah. It's, it's, and, and, the reality is, and the reality is you're not going to, you're not, you can't help everybody, right? Like the, if you could, you know, if you could yeah. f- figure out that formula, yeah. you'd, you'd be a gajillionaire. But, uh, yeah, exactly. you know, you got to be, you exactly. got to be open to want the help, I would think. Yeah. You know, you, you go in there, do the best you can and with humility and you present the information and you really leave it up to the individual to make their own choices. Well, this has been great. Um, I've really enjoyed this. Um, I think it's much needed. I, 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 I'm happy to see like my, I have three daughters and I, I hear some of the stories that they have about the companies they're working for. Some not so good, but some good also. Some really good things that the companies are doing to create a really uplifting and positive uh, work environment, ha- create good work-life balance, make it so that people mm-hmm. love coming to, to the office and come, you know, giving them a little bit of that, you know, uh, hybrid environment where you get to work from home a couple of days a week, but they're required to be in the office That's and true. it makes... So yeah. things like that. So I'm encouraged that, at the uh, younger generation and so what these companies are doing to create this environment. So hopefully uh, you continue your work and it can help a lot of other companies. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I'd like to just show you like my, my recent book that came out just a couple months ago. Yep. Uh, it's called Mindfulness for the Wandering Mind. It was published by Wiley. And uh, it basically covers everything I talk about in my speeches. Okay. You know, how to, how to have a good workplace culture, how to be a mindful leader, how to take care of your mental and physical and emotional well-being. And it's available on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles. So you know, I think cool. maybe your listeners would find it helpful. Absolutely. And, I, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to actually get to that to say, hey, where, where can they go get your book? Uh, and I apologize. <laughs> I, ha- I I bought the book, but I have not read it. I usually try to read the book before I have guests on. I just couldn't get to it, but I plan on reading it because uh, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating subject. So, but, so yeah. if someone wanted to get in touch with you, how would they do that? Well, so... I'm, I can be easily found on LinkedIn. Okay. Pandit Dasa, just find me motivational keynote speaker and uh, follow me there. I'm posting content there regularly, helpful content. You can message me there as well. And of course, my website, punditdasa.com, just like my name.com, has li- top li- speech topics that I speak on, descriptions, video, short videos of me that are on there that you can watch, some in news interviews that I've awesome. done. So, and my books are also listed on my website. So that's probably the one place to go to for everything you kind of need to know about my work and myself as well. Yeah. All right, Panda. This was awesome. Well, we'll end on that note. Uh, wish you the best. You're doing great work out there. I, I, I'm fascinated by your story. The, the monk piece, I got to tell you, is the f- most fascinating piece to me. I don't know how anyone can do that, but maybe I should try it. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> Hey, why not? You can start with a couple of days and then take it from there. <laughs> there you go. So, all right. Well, that's a wrap for uh, this edition of the Business Brains and the Bottom Line Podcast. This is uh, Paul Delegro signing off. Until next time. 